Bueno, eh, buenas tardes. Primero quería daros las gracias a todos por, por venir. Mi nombre es Chema Casao, soy de Estratio y me vais a permitir una pequeña introducción para que quería dar las gracias a Paolo de, de Confluent y explicaros un poco. Eh, Confluent y hoy van a hablar Paolo de, de Confluent y Oscar de, de Estratio. Y bueno, pues hemos llegado a un acuerdo de colaboración para, pues ya sabéis los que nos conocéis, que teníamos el Meetup de Kafka, que sabéis que es una de las tecnologías que usamos en Estratio, tanto para el producto como para los proyectos y lo teníamos un poco abandonadito. Entonces, la idea ahora, gracias a, a Paolo y a Confluent, es eh, activar la comunidad y tenemos la suerte hoy de que, de que va a venir pues, a hacer hoy una introducción de Kafka y Oscar nos va a contar un caso de uso muy interesante, pero ya en septiembre va a venir otro evento y, lo, y la idea es que, que, bueno, pues que hagamos esa, esa labor de, de difusión de, de Kafka, de la tecnología y, y, como siempre, con el espíritu de estos eventos, que sea un evento de comunidad, y de aprendizaje para todos. Así que, Paolo, thank you very much for, for coming. So, please, welcome to Madrid. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Okay, let's see if this thing works. Works. First of all, uh, let's try to know each other a little bit. How many of you are a developer? How many of you are a system administrator? How many of you are something else? All right. For developers, how many Java? Scala? Python? C, C Sharp? Rust, good. Oh, we don't have a client for Rust. Okay, L let's start. Uh, uh, mine uh, is a very uh, brief introduction on uh, on Kafka, but I want to give you a feeling of uh, the project Kafka from the inside and the company around it. Oh, before we we, we start, uh, uh, next time beer before. Then we do the talks, and then more beer at the end, yeah? And um, I want to tell you a little bit of, of a project I did last year. I joined Confluent at the end of uh, 2016. Uh, um, and this uh, was uh, a project uh, that we did uh, with a government. I will tell you the government. But forget about technology. And if you think about how we handle data these days, I will do a claim that is strange, database lose data, or they lose the history, yeah? If you look at a database of customer, you look at the person, the email address, the phone number, you just see the current value. You don't see all the previous value. Database don't keep the history. And if we look about data, you can think about that everything is a sort of a, like an event. Is a something has happened at a certain point in time. And we record it as we sold something, we received uh, an invoice, we made a trade, or we had an experience in interaction with uh, a website or an application. If I add something in a shopping cart, I don't check out, it's still an event. And sometimes these events are valuable. And um, imagine a government where you uh, don't need to read any of the documentation of how the, wo uh, the government works. You don't need to know the rules. You just tell them, your event, I'm having a child, somebody in my family died, I broke my leg, I cannot go to work, am I entitled, I'm entitled to some money? I don't need to read it, I just tell my government the event. And Norway, the Norwegian Work and Welfare Administration is just doing this in Oslo. They have this vision that is very powerful and they are uh, delivering right now, where life is a stream of event, so they tell their citizen, don't read the rules, just tell us what's going on and we will act uh, for you. So a, a, an event of a, a person becomes an event in Kafka and all the departments, all the governments will read it and act upon it if they need to do something. 
And uh, in Norway, of course, uh, they don't have many citizens, only 5.2 million. So the Kafka cluster is very, very small. The retention is forever. How many life events, life-changing events or uh, that you need to communicate to your government, you may have. And sometimes certain benefits, certain things, you need to know also the grandmother, grandfathers, and the parents. So the retention of these events are forever. So basically, I will be dead, and there will be still events for Norway citizen in the Kafka cluster. Um, there are other um, validation and data points that I wanted to uh, bring to you and, uh, and point you at. For example, recently, the Gartner uh, published a report with uh, the uh, top 10 strategic uh, technology trends for 2018. And they claim, they say that having driven model is one of its uh, top 10 trends. This is exactly how uh, the government in Norway is thinking and is doing. Where Kafka comes from? Why Kafka was created? What was the problem that the Kafka creators uh, tried to solve? And uh, Kafka comes from LinkedIn. And uh, uh, Jay Krebs, that is the uh, co-creator of, uh, of Kafka with his team when he was working at LinkedIn and the co-founder of, uh, of Confluent, was faced with um, a very messy uh, situation. This is uh, a simplification. I'm Italian, so I call it uh, uh, spaghetti data integration or point-to-point -point, uh, data integration. And if you need to count the number of uh, line, the number of uh, spaghetti grows quadratically with the number of systems you want to integrate. And when you want to add a new source of data or a new destination of your data, you need to pay a linear cost. If I want to talk with n system, I need to write n integrations. And this is simply not scalable, is slowing down organizations. I worked with another uh, customer last year. Uh, this is Nordea. I can mention the customer. And uh, we work with them with the uh, uh, part of the bank that does a capital market. They are the only part uh, in the bank I found that are able to draw a picture like this about their system. And it's composed by thousands of lines. The other part of Nordea, the, the, the overall of uh, Nordea, cannot even draw a picture to understand how complex they are. So now imagine if we could change from an architectural perspective this, or, uh, this system and put something in the middle that we call Apache Kafka between your sources of data and your destinations of data. Now we reduce the number of spaghetti to a linear system, to a is equivalent to the number of uh, sources and destinations. And if I want to add a new source or a new destination, I don't need to pay a cost that is linear with the number of system. I just pay a fixed cost, one. I just need to talk with the bus. I just need to be able to read from the bus. Of course, if I build a business on this, if I build an architecture uh, that looks like this for a, a large organization, it needs to be full tolerant, resilient, scalable, always up and running, secure, and uh, all these characteristics. And uh, LinkedIn nowadays works like this. Everything, when you add a, a new contact to your network, uh, this is an event in Kafka, and it will trigger uh, all sorts of uh, things behind the scene, all in real time. Uh, probably these uh, numbers are, are old. Uh, but uh, this is the amount of data that they store in Kafka. This is the number of messages, 1.2 trillion per day. Um, thousands of data streams. And they feed this data into their data warehouse, their big data, data lakes, uh, and so on. I mentioned already Jay Krebs, co-creator of uh, Kafka, uh, when he was at LinkedIn, a co-founder of Confluent. He wrote a small book. Uh, called I Heart Logs, I Love Logs. And um, he also wrote a very interesting um, uh, small article published on the O'Reilly website. I put here the link. You will see that uh, in the slides I put the link so you can go and read uh, carefully about it. And these are the lessons learned uh, around uh, trying to deploy Kafka scale and trying to do 
um, well, what some people call online machine learning. When I receive an event, I need to do two things. One is use this event uh, for my user. Is this transaction a fraud or not? Is this call uh, um, a regular call or a, a fraud? Should I reject this? Uh, this person, what is the banner I need to show, show it to him right now? This kind of things is putting a machine learning model in production, but is also using, there is also the possibility to use this event to update a model in real time. So as events come in, I score, I use the model in production, and I also use this event to online, in real time, update the model. It's not uh, easy, uh, but it's doable. And, and uh, in this small article, Jay explained uh, what kind of challenges you need to overcome in order to solve this problem. Kafka is not used only on uh, Silicon Valley companies. This is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, an estimate of uh, the penetration of Apache Kafka with the Fortune 500 company, the 500 largest company uh, in the world. And this, uh, you can see that uh, the more uh, data-driven a business is, the more data-driven a company is, the more likely is that they are going down the route of uh, real-time uh, streams of data and this kind of idea of events in order to become agile, in order to become fast at interacting with their customers. Uh, think about uh, this is another Silicon Valley company, Uber, for example, when you book a taxi, when you see the car approaching, uh, are all events in Kafka. We do not have only uh, Silicon Valley. This is a slide I wanted to, to bring you here, just to mention yet another customer, another uh, large organization, and very traditional, uh, a large bank in Canada, using uh, Kafka and working with Confluent. And uh, look at the adjective that they use, it's like, the, the once they started to do a project, when they deployed the first project and uh, they understood the technology, the adoption was massive and organic. And this is also really, really important. Uh, Kafka is not uh, easy from, uh, not always easy from an operational perspective. You need to spend a little bit of time to it. But from a developer perspective, sending a message to Kafka, one line of code, receiving a message from Kafka, one line of code, doing a little bit of uh, logic with Kafka streams, two or three lines of code. And this is something that the developer can learn very, very quickly. And the clients for Kafka or the client for Kafka streams are very small jars with no dependency. And this is also really important when you develop micro microservices, you want something small. I'm uh, an ex-researcher, and uh, if I look uh, back and if I look at and I think what, what's driving the adoption of Kafka, what are the industry trends behind Kafka? And I, s I see three uh, trends. Uh, first of all, I come from a, an Hadoop vendor, so I, I really know well what batch means. And I saw and I see every day a trend of a large organi organization moving away from batch system and going into real-time uh, stream processing. Some people call it uh, uh, big data. Some people call it fast data stream processing. Think about a bank. Once you give me an app on my phone and I can do payment, I can do all the operations as I walk into a branch, the daily transaction doesn't make really, really sense. At night, you cannot shut down and do the bad jobs. The other big trend, the other big trend uh, that I see is uh, Internet of Things. If you think about sensors uh, that are sending data to a backend system into a data center, uh, these events are all structure, timestamp, a, a metric, and a value. The temperature in this room is this. The temperature in this room is this, every five seconds. And Kafka is, has been designed to receive events, to receive uh, a series of events and just append them. Yeah? So Kafka is perfect for this. Um, do you have 10 million devices sending you data? No problem. Probably four or five. Uh, brokers you will need, but it's doable. And the other last uh, trend I see is uh, microservices. And uh, if I need to summarize uh, 
what's the big difference? Because we have been uh, uh, seeing uh, service architecture for uh, 10 years or more. The big difference uh, here is uh, that services are exchanging uh, asynchronous messages. I can send a message or I can send data to a service even when the service is not up and running because this data will be published to Kafka and if that service is down for maintenance, if that service at a certain point is low and cannot pick it up, it's fine. It will be buffered in Kafka and they can read it from Kafka. So I think this decoupling of services is really super important. You don't want to build a service infrastructure where each service depends on many others and then when you have a problem you have a cascading, ef cascading effect. So Kafka is not just about messaging. It has two different characteristics uh, that the messaging systems in the past didn't have. Of course, it's a pub sub system. So you send a message, it is kept into Kafka, and then somebody could come and take it. But it's different from a queue system. In a queue, when you consume a message, the message will be deleted, disappear. In Kafka, the message will stay. So how long? Seven days, seven years, forever, you decide. Each topic, each queue, if you want to, to, to use the term queue, each topic can have a different retention and it's configurable. And where do you store the messages? It's on disk. So a topic, it's a folder on disk. A topic is divided in multiple partitions. These are subdirectory into that folder. Each partition is divided in segment, one gigabyte each is configurable. And these are files in those folders. So you can have a look at your disk and that is where the data is stored. And then we, were, we, we, we saw with uh, people using Kafka, you have this flow of data moving from a, a source to a destination. You see it moving and you would like to do a little bit of processing. So a lot of people we're using stream processing engines to take data from Kafka into the stream processing engine, doing something, and back into Kafka with the results. So we wrote uh, a, a stream processing engine inside Kafka, and it's called Kafka Streams. So to summarize, uh, Kafka is not just a pub sub system. You can store data as long as you want, even petabyte of data if you want, and you can do stream processing. This is me with a Linux background, trying to explain to people with Unix background the kind of uh, uh, Kafka APIs. Yeah, I'm taking the content of a file, I'm filtering out and, and keeping only the lines that contain Apache, and then I'm doing a little bit of uh, transformation and processing, putting everything capital, uh, capital case, and then storing the output into another file. In Kafka, part of uh, the Apache Kafka project, you have set API, API, a set of APIs to send messages from one producer to a consumer, exactly like the pipe in Unix to send a message from one process to another. You are, we have a set of APIs and a set of connectors to do the input-output. For us, the input could be Oracle database, could be a mainframe, could be an SAP system, could be uh, a, fi a file. Uh, the destination, Mongo, Cassandra, HBase, there are hundreds of, uh, of connectors. So these are the, the input and output. And then, of course, once you have the data in your hand, you would like to do some sort of uh, business logic to, to, to process it. This is another way, another meta metaphor to, to see the APIs for those that are more familiar with databases or ETL systems. The connect APIs are doing the extract and loading and the transform APIs can be done uh, with uh, uh, the stream APIs. Let me tell you two words of uh, the connect APIs because uh, how many of you are using Kafka? How many of you are using Kafka in production? Kafka connect? So, okay. The fraction of, uh, of people using Kafka and Kafka connect is, Kafka connect is still not uh, well known and Kafka Streams even less. So let me tell you two words on Kafka Connect. It's part of Apache Kafka, as I said. Think about like a framework to make life easy 
for people that want to extract data from a source and load data into a destination. So we allow you to write connectors, and these connectors will run distributed on a set of machines called Kafka Connect Cluster. And you decide two machines or 20 machines. If a machine goes down uh, when uh, you are moving data, nothing happens. The flow will continue. Behind the scene, uh, at the end of the day, a connector is still using the uh, Kafka APIs, Kafka producer and consumer APIs. The consumer is still a consumer group. All the benefits that you have in Kafka will be uh, leveraged by the, um, the connectors. But there are other uh, benefits, for example. Uh, there is a layer of REST APIs that you can use to start up a new connector, see what are the connectors running, and automate the operations. There are easy APIs uh, that you don't need to deal with uh, many, many, many things. And um, we also integrated with, um, when you use Apache Avro, with a schema registry, and the connectors can leverage this. It's automatically uh, fault tolerance, and I, I don't need to think about that. And the configuration is a simple uh, JSON file. Yeah? So everything can be automated with Ansible scripts or something like that. You need to know Java. You need to be a Java developer if you want to write the connectors. You need to learn a, a little bit the APIs. It takes a, a few days. Uh, but once you have done one, it, it will take you one day, no more, to write a, a connector. It's like writing a small plugin for a, a new framework. How many of you have used uh, Kafka Streams? OK, see, very, very few. Um, I used, uh, in the past, I used Storm, Flink, Spark Streaming, um, and uh, other systems so that were doing, was, was were doing stream processing. If I look at Kafka Streams, I will say that um, uh, the computational power, the operators, are equivalent to existing uh, open source uh, stream processing engines. There is, if you want, there is one uh, thing you cannot do with Kafka Streams that uh, uh, efficiently. Let's put it, you cannot do it efficiently. That is sorting data. Because for us, we have only streams of infinite uh, amount of data. What does it mean, sorting? Yeah. Other than that, uh, is equivalent to the other system. And I invite you to, make a com to do a comparison. Go through the documentations and do a side-by-side -side comparison with your favorite stream processing engine. I'm doing this operation. Do I have this? How do I do? From a client perspective, from a developer perspective, Kafka Streams is a single jar with no dependency. It's a small library. How do I run it? You can put it in a Word file and deploy on a serverless container, or you can use Docker and Kubernetes. Up to you. It's a Java application. How do I use Kafka Streams? I just add this library into my class path. That's it. Nothing else, nothing more. And it's a small jar with no dependency. In the past, I had problems when I was using a stream processing engine. It was coming with 100 gigabyte of dependencies. And uh, often, these dependencies were, were, were not the version of the library that I wanted to use. And you end up in the jar help problem that you have multiple versions of the same library. And you need to do sharing and waste a lot of time to, to get out of that. There are another, another beautiful uh, aspect of Kafka Streams is at runtime, you can grow the number of instances that are running your applications. And it will grow elas elastic you have elasticity. If a machine goes down, nothing happens. The flow will continue. Why? Behind the scene, I still have consumer groups. Each consumer in a, in a consumer group will consume a partition. And if that consumer dies, that partition is given to another consumer. At Confluent, on top of Kafka Streams, uh, we built uh, what we call uh, KSQL. This is about streaming SQL. And uh, basically, and I, I make it very, very short, but we take a SQL query, and we write the Kafka Streams code for you. And uh, the algebra of SQL is very fam will be very, very familiar with you. So you have joins, aggregate function, windowing functions. Uh, you can do projection, select, and so on. What you cannot do is group by. You cannot do sorting. Same reason as before. And here, for example, you see we create a stream called VIP Actions. It's a selector. We take user, user ID page and action from two input streams. 
click streams and users and we join by user ID and filter out uh, the user uh, only the user that have a level platinum okay there is no table behind here it's just done in real time this query you submit it and it's a streaming query it will run forever until you kill it this is really really powerful I put a video of five minutes to, to convince you here but we cannot show it now and when I show that video people don't believe it and there are no tables it's just input Kafka topics behind the scene this is is a picture to give you a for the architects or uh, people that work as a system administrator just to give you an idea an intuition of uh, from a logical perspective Kafka brokers and zookeeper are my core cluster at the core of my cluster and everything around it can be managed by different people so if you want to use Kafka connect you see I put it between the sources and the systems you could have multiple of these uh, clusters we develop a rest proxy schema registry the stream processing application different team they don't need to be the same team that is managing the Kafka brokers KSQL server different teams uh, each team around Kafka can use different versions and this is uh, for people that think about bare metal this is the layout of the same uh, uh, number of nodes in three racks and this can I can kill a rack and it's still up and running and processing data or I and there is no single point of failure in this uh, diagram this system I come from an Hadoop vendor and I see two sides of the coin for me batch and streaming needs to live together there are certain workloads that make sense to do in in batch where you want throughput rather than latency there are certain workloads where you want very very low latency and then a true streaming processing engine like Kafka streams is what you want and here I try to put the a diagram to show you exactly this and uh, of course uh, you need to have these two systems talking to each other you need to be able to send data from Kafka into Hadoop and so on and we can do that I, I mentioned a, a trend and uh, you will do a talk on microservices so I'm not going to take a lot of time here but I say Kafka is a very very good fit for microservices architecture often you have hundreds of small services and you want them to talk in an asynchronous way and Kafka is great for that plus you can also do stream processing to do complex logic to build aggregate function filter and provide reports in real time and this is my colleague Ben and he wrote a very nice book on uh, designing event driven systems uh, one year before the Garnet was saying it's important it's important when you look at the open source project to understand who is behind how, how am I doing with the time I think I'm on time uh, okay it's important to understand uh, who are the people behind it who is driving the, the project forward how they do how they work how they interact with the community and um, and, and try to see where they work what why they are there so here is my way to to capture the um, the Apache Kafka PMC member and the committers the Apache Software Foundation works uh, in in this way for every project there is uh, a number of committers these are the people that are allowed to check in check out uh, code and and make changes on the Apache Software Foundation servers uh, and then uh, there is a subset of PMC member that uh, can uh, bring in new uh, committers and can take important decisions on the project so here you can find uh, uh, up in the top left corner is uh, June is a uh, our chief uh, uh, architect or main engineers and then uh, Nea uh, she is our CTO and uh, and then uh, number four is uh, Jay Krebs that is our CEO and uh, Nea June and Jay were all at LinkedIn and were part of the core team that created something to solve the LinkedIn problem and then they decided to call it Kafka and then they decided to make it open source and donate it to the Apache Software Foundation I was uh, looking at uh, some uh, data points to give you to inspire you to, to learn more about Kafka and invest on your personal skills maybe learn Kafka streams or, or learn Kafka connect 
And uh, Udemy is a community about learning. You probably know it. You probably have seen it. And they did a survey across uh, 20 million uh, uh, users and customers that they have. And they compiled a list of the 10 hot uh, uh, skills for uh, this year, 2018. Number one is Kafka. Yeah, go and check it out. At Confluent, we are very open as an organization, very transparent. Not only we contribute massively to the open source project, uh, most of the things we do are open source, not all uh, Apache Software Foundation project, project for various reasons, but they are open source. You can find it on GitHub. All our documentation is online. And uh, when we write books, and I put some books here, we also share it for free, so you can download these books. And I would really recommend uh, to read the one from Jay, I love logs. If you are developing microservices, uh, uh, designing event-driven system, it's a great, great, great book. And then, of course, uh, for uh, uh, the Bible of Kafka, is uh, first edition is Kafka, The Definite Guide, written by Nea and Gwen, uh, two of my colleagues, and Todd, uh, that is uh, working on LinkedIn. On open source project, this is what uh, my, my simple way to say. It's not just about the project. How many of you are using Linux? Do you build up your distribution? <laughs> Maybe when you s when it's something you can do at the university, but not in the real life. And uh, same, how many are using Hadoop? Okay, a few. Are you building up your Hadoop distribution by yourself, or you're taking one from uh, from from the vendors? And this is it. So Kafka is at the very beginning. Kafka is simpler than other systems. So in theory, right now, like for Hadoop at the beginning, like for Linux at the beginning, you could download all the source code and build it from yourself and do everything by hand. This is not uh, what we should be doing in our daily job. We should be focusing on the need of our company, what we, re what we really try to achieve. These are just tools. Yeah. So Kafka, for us, is Confluent, is what, what Kafka is what we do. We build a distribution of Kafka and eco ecosystem project and component around it. I put a slide to, to show you. Most of the things, as I said, uh, we do are open source. There are certain things that uh, we keep away and we want to use it to exchange for dollars. And um, we build RPM packages for uh, Red Hat, CentOS, and all the other uh, derived uh, Linux distribution dev packages. We also build uh, Docker images and we publish those on the Docker Hub. And we share also the source code that we use to build the Docker images. So if you need to make a change, customize it a little bit, uh, you can check out uh, our source code, add your own changes, and build the uh, Docker images for you. And we also uh, run perfectly well off Mesos. And of course, you can download all the source code and do it by yourself. And uh, this is a, a, a small... Uh, um, demo you can check it out i was really when i started i was doing demos all the times and I w i'm very super lazy so i said uh, to my colleagues we, you know we should have uh, documentation on, on how to run the demo but not internally let's share it with everybody we should uh, uh, publish our demo code uh, uh, on github and and um, and we should also have videos of uh, one good guy good speaker not me recorded himself doing the, the demo. We have all of this now, uh, so go and check it out. This is taking live changes from Wikipedia that they publish on the IRC channel. We develop a small connector to take those, those changes, load it into Kafka. We use KSQL to uh, transform this data, and we load it into Elastic. And Wikibana, we give you a dashboard that shows you right now who are the 10 most uh, prolific uh, Wikipedia author right now, Yeah, what they are doing. All of this is with monitoring. All of this is uh, with security. It's a demo. It's a demo. Promise you won't use it in production. It's just a demo, but it's uh, with Docker. So you can install everything on a laptop very easily. We, we put everything, uh, all, uh, all our code uh, and all our packages on online. You can download it. And uh, that's it. That's all for me. OK?
Hello, good afternoon all. Um, thanks for coming. Um, let me um, introduce myself. I'm Oscar Gomez. I work in Stratio as software architect and developer. And there is my contact info, so feel free. <laughs> and this is more or less the agenda for today. Uh, we're gonna start talking about some basic of even driver architecture. Um, then uh, we try to explain a use case. I have to, to say that it's not in all the detail I would like, but for some privacy policies of our client, I can show you all the details. Um, then I wanna show you the architecture solution for this use case and how we um, understand the or try to understand the business of our client and develop uh, the best architecture for this problem. And then we test it in production. And with the all the knowledge, knowledge that we can get from this test, how we try to improve this architecture. Okay, for even driver's architecture, the best way I found to explain is in words of Monty Fowler, something like that. <laughs> is we can talk about uh, even driver architecture when we understand our enterprise application like a system that reacts an event for outside the world. And for this even driver and architecture, we have um, several patterns, and depending on the use of these events we have. We have the perhaps the simple one that is the event notification when the system only sends an event notification when something changed. And we don't care um, nothing about the response. Then we can evolve a little and can talk about the even current uh, transfers, even current state transfer. That is when we our system not only notify a change. In this even message, we are we gonna uh, send all the details that the recipient system needs to work. So this system that are receiving events don't have to tell nothing or communicate for nothing with the source system. With this, this information, it can work alone. And my favorite is the event sourcing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the event sourcing that. Um, the basic idea, idea is not to share the, the state, not to share a notification. Notify the change per se of your system. Is perhaps if you are uh, managing a store, a stock of a store, and you are selling pens, if you sell five pens, you only have to send to the event bus, hey, um, are five less pens in our stock. So, with this approach, the event store becomes the principal source of truth of our system. And we can reconstruct the state of it, uh, only replaying that event source that can uh, go with a Kafka cluster very, very easy. And this is a pattern that is not uh, a event source pattern, uh, pattern as but it's something that uh, combines very well with these patterns because it's the common and query segregation responsibility. That is nothing more that uh, separate our uh, writing and uh, writing and reading data models in different uh, modes. <laughs> When we go to implement a event-driven architecture, 
uh, maybe always we have uh, a mesal broker like Kafka that uh, is nothing more than a um, that, uh, message system through the service communicate, but we can do in a brokerless mode that when the service communicate directly. Um, well, this is the, the benefits of that, but I think the Paul also is uh, better than me that that. So it's loss coupling, message buffering, explicit event entry process. And this is some of the drawbacks, but I think the only we can pay attention is the operational complexity because with the new technologies, the bottlenecks is, are not really a problem. And that's the basic idea of uh, what is a uh, event driver architecture. I'm going to present you what is the real case we implement. We have for this uh, is appointment creation system. Okay, as when you have to go, for example, to a mechanic, <laughs> to the, your car to the mechanic, you have to uh, uh, do appointment in the center you wanna, you're gonna go. Uh, this is uh, the requirement. It's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's only the user can consult calendars and be able to create appointments. And the interesting thing at this part is that um, the we have a, a one requirement what was. Uh, if we um, find that uh, appointment have uh, several prob probability of miss, uh, we can overload the capacity of this of this hole of this uh, availability, and we were gonna see how to do it. We got admin users that can uh, query the, all the appointments, all the existing appointments, and can create an appointment in the name of a user of, or a client. And we have. Uh, BI, BI users that with all this information of the appointments can do uh, some analytical use of, of this, some metrics, um, showing it uh, through dashboards, all those things. And also we have a requirement to have a bunch of data scientists that can do uh, advanced analytical uh, with this data, this data. Um, this is our performance required. That is not so easy. <laughs> that we can have a uh, response time uh, more for 20, 2050, 2050 milliseconds. Our system has to support 10,000 online users doing operations in windows of two minutes. And the replication data between the uh, operational part and the analytic part uh, delay has be less of than, than me. And for this problem that don't seem easy, <laughs> this is our big picture proposal of the architecture that um, in what you see is uh, we have a microservice layer with uh, the domain services that has his own persistent. We want a Kafka broker to all the, the measures uh, change, so with the measures, uh, to manage the measures and we have always to communicate with the uh, informational part. We do this the, with a tool developed in Stratia that is a Sparta that is built on top of a Spark streaming that to do the some aggregation uh, and persists in a model 
and HDFS for storage, da for storage data. And we have uh, some tools to do dashboards and some ab advanced analytics. And this is our approach, our first approach, uh, our microservice architecture. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that this is our first approach. Uh, this is uh, the first contact with the client. We don't know so much about its, its business. So in a domain-driven uh, approach, we only identify the, the big domain. That are those three that you see there. And we want to spend so much time and do the, the, the work of a split it directly because we want to fail, for sure. Uh, we want uh, to can go to a simple way. And when the use comes, uh, they it's, it's use uh, going to uh, give you the, the experience to do the, this split well. What you have to do really is be uh, really conscious uh, with implementation and decouple it as much as possible. All you can see here is, uh, for example, the appointment. The appointment domain is a service, a big service with uh, two main functionalities that is uh, implemented totally decoupled. It's no dependencies uh, between it. And between this, when it needs to communicate, is the uh, is, is an event sending or event publishing, not, di not directly, no HTTP calls, no sharing um, some, uh, some POYOs or some mobile objects, nothing, nothing like that. It's uh, perhaps uh, more detailed for uh, the appointment use case. We have to create an appointment. For create an appointment, uh, we have a PostgreSQL in, in our first approach with a, uh, a strong constraint. If the insert is possible, okay, you can you can. Uh, take your appointment, it's the truth. You have an appointment. When, you, when it, it happens, we populate an appointment, an appointment event. This appointment event is an internal event. It's like, uh, for example, front, front end application do all the time. It's an internal event that is uh, receiving bad bits, there is a functionality over there that is, we call it absentees, that uh, we're gonna uh, talk with the appointment propensity model that is uh, an AI model that uh, bring us the um, result of a AI training model that give the uh, absentees ratio, the probability of this appointment will missed. With this, with this uh, information, we propagate a uh, other event that is the absentee event in our request response uh, approach, and the appointment will update this enriched data on the on the database. At, at the same time. We populate an event. This is the, s the event that will travel uh, to all the systems. That is put in in, a, in a, uh, an Apache Kafka and is receiving back the calendar and update the calendar model. If you see there, it's our first warning, caution, heavy traffic. We will explain it here more. And, and this is our calendar uh, model. We got the other uh, two domains, this ag uh, the agenda domain, that is nothing more than the rules 
to create a calendar, to create a, a, bill, a viability calendar. This something like uh, this employee attends uh, appointments on this center um, from Monday to Friday, from eight to 12. With this, this kind of thing, we go an initial goal in a catch, in a catch, main catch solution. And then uh, we, sh we only do the queries to the calendar. And for the creation, created event query, we use the same model of the visit creation that the visitor is the only, uh, the other warning we have. Mm -hmm. We will explain it in more detail in next slides. And this is uh, more or less the architecture for the APIs, the metric part. These domains and these events we talked before are traveling about uh, through Kafka cluster. We have uh, another for another persistence for events, just for for security. We never use, <laughs> but for security. Go to this tool, this workflow tool that I built on top of, uh, of, of a Spark and process the data in different way to build some KPAs that can be, uh, that can be vi uh, visualized in a dashboard uh, tool like the discovery that is um, strat other strategy tool. And this is more or less the first approach of our architecture. And with this, we have this uh, performance test scenario that is, well, we are deployed in Azure, in Azure Cloud and we have a, a pre-charge for the, the appointment uh, models to do some, some realistic to the in realistic fashion to the to the test, there are more of um, eight, eighty-four thousand of agendas registers in in our cache that is that is correspond uh, of a, a year of real production data of our client. Then we have all the production master data loaded in the system, and we're gonna test with this. Uh, distribution, 37% uh, of calendar search, um, uh, 16 appointment insert, 15% of appointment just settled or, ca or canceled, and 30% uh, of created appointment that is the distribution that the numbers of the client can have. This is the real numbers of of the existing system use. Um, this is the resource configuration. We have uh, uh, the calendar microservice with four cores and four gigas with an out of color config from two or to five stamps. The appointment with just one core and just giga and the same instance. And the master that is other service that only the give the, for example, the user data or the center data with this uh, number. And this is the number that I think that is a very good number. We reach the goal that is uh, for two hour performance with 88 uh, transaction per minute uh, with more than 20, uh, 10,000 users. We have a media of 20, second, 20, 20 milliseconds for calendar search, or since just to declare the numbers, very, really good number. This is the, the requirement, but we do so well that we double the requirement and the numbers are still good and are still in the requirement. We are still doing the goal. <laughs> And, but 
the, this architecture, as you see, is not perfect. This is a false approach. And we uh, are noticed some in, the, in those tests. We saw some gaps or some possible points of fracture that was the in, in the creative cluster warning that you see in the, in the previous slide. That's was the appointment sets, the calendar service responsibility, we have too many, and the, the CAT uh, system. For the appointment sets, we, use, we really are using the, the same model. So when the load is high, the performance slow down. So perhaps it's not the best solution. And the calendar, uh, the same thing. We have the responsibility of the CIF, Kafka events and processes with the calculation of overbooking and update the, the catch system. And at the same time are uh, attending requests for calendar availabilities. Too much responsibility. The numbers are good, but I think that it can be even better, even yes, even best. And the main capture, uh, we have good numbers with the solution, but uh, this is not a really distributable, no, not a scaling solution, and they have they don't have this own persist. We have to persist uh, ourselves all the info to crash recoveries or something like that uh, without, if you don't have this, you have to replay all the all these events and get to the state you, you have before the crash. So if uh, you have a persistent system, it's better. And with this number, we have uh, this more sophisticated, I think, architecture when you have um, Kafka as real data backbone uh, with a segregation uh, with in command and query model for the appointment, uh, appointment uh, domain. And for this uh, query model, we are using or we are implementing now a Kafka stream con consumer for all these events to um, load that query model. And the same thing for, for the calendar. The, uh, we can we change the, the, the catch solution for Apache Ignite that was a, a really a scalable and distributed catch solution. And for the update of these calendars, we do a uh, a string consumer from Kafka that is a functionality of Ignite itself. And we have uh, the query calendar, uh, the query directly to Apache Ignite that have a easy, easy SQL um, way to do that main cats don't have. Um, this is more or less, I think that I go so fast, <laughs> but sorry. <laughs> And this is uh, all we have for today. If you have any question, it's time. Ahora mismo lo estamos probando. We are trying now and uh, don't have the, the same load for the, for, for the system, but uh, now, uh, the in the calendar set, we are on the perhaps 20 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds for the same load. So it's a, a, good, uh, a good performance. And for the appointment, uh, we have uh, pretty much the same, the same numbers, but uh, the query is more, is is better, and we can with this stream we can enrich the data and to facilitate the the life of the front people. <laughs> they don't have to say do a lot of requests to get the data.
more questions, more t-shirts. <laughs> Eh, no soy la persona más adecuada para contarte esto porque no soy de sistemas. I'm not the best person to do. Ah, vale. Si lo hubieras dicho desde el principio. <risa> eh, no soy la mejor persona para decirte esto porque no soy de sistemas, ¿vale? Pero sé que teníamos un clúster con, con tres brokers, ¿vale? Por lo de aquello de la alta disponibilidad y estas cosas. Y realmente no era. O sea, según ellos, no era demasiado grande. Esto creo que puede decir todo el tiempo. <risa> ¿Vale? Si luego me pido la camiseta, está muy lejos. <risa> ¿Vale? ¿Sí? Bueno, él ha ido primero. ¿Sí? ¿Sí? Si no te digo nada. porque necesitamos una transacción puerta, ¿vale? O sea, lo primero que necesitas es, tu negocio es crear visitas. Entonces, necesitas una respuesta así y además, como necesitas una respuesta así de rápida, lo que necesitas es, realmente es que la propia base de datos pueda resolverte eso. Es decir, tú creas una, una constraint fuerte para decir, ¿puedes o no puedes crear la, el appointment, la visita? Si, te, si la base de datos te dice que puedes, eso es verdad, la cita está creada. Y luego ya disparas tu evento y haces todo el procesamiento del dato que tienes detrás. Pero, o sea, si lo hicieras en Kafka, esto lo hicieras de una manera asíncrona, no tendrías esa respuesta rápida. <risa> Estaba el primero. <risa> Sí, es una cuestión de, de confianza en el delivery Kafka hasta ahora. De hecho, algo que no, que no he contado es que nuestro sistema de, de recuperación de, de la base de datos es hacer un replay de los eventos en Kafka. O sea, es nuestro backup, digamos. Es por temas de, de tiempo de respuesta. O sea, fíjate, teníamos que, que conseguir que todas las operaciones contestaran en menos de 250 milisegundos. Eh, para dejarlo en un, eh, en un sistema síncrono, a lo mejor es jugártelo un poco. No, la verdad es que ya te digo que las pruebas, visto que las pruebas de Express eran bastante heavy y no hemos tenido ningún problema con eso. Eh, estaba primero él. Dime, Gastón. La verdad es que ahora mismo estamos probando. Pues tú lo sabes mejor que nadie. <risa> lo que estamos probando, y este es el, el primer caso de uso que yo he visto súper útil de Ignite, pero tal y como está funcionando, de, de, de hecho, me quiero cargar el trofeo. No, era en todo Spring Boot, ¿vale? Eh, sí, todo Spring Boot. Y, bueno, sí que, por ejemplo, para este Spring estamos, estoy pensando hacerlo en Scala porque es más fácil. Más, eh, para, porque es más bonito, más que más fácil, ¿sabes? Y combina unas cosas. No, eh, Spring, eh, Spring Kafka directamente. No Spring Cloud Stream, sino la librería de Kafka directamente, por temas de versiones. Cloud Stream te obliga a ir con ciertas versiones y nosotros te necesitamos un poco más de elasticidad. Eh, me están diciendo que se acaba el tiempo. Que, ah, ¿no? ¿No? No, pues no. Podéis preguntarme. Me quedo con vuestras caras, luego tenéis camiseta, creo.
Por eso la, la separación de, de responsabilidad. Eso es, el, ese es el problema por el que en, esta primera, en este primer acercamiento que hicimos no teníamos claro cómo se iba a comportar, no vimos problema, pero sí que no, y no llegamos a tener realmente el problema. O sea, las pruebas de estrés todo fue bien, no tuvimos ninguna pérdida, no se cayó, no tuvimos cosas raras, pero sí que vimos que en algún momento podía ser un problema y por eso hicimos la… Uy, perdón, <risa> hicimos esa separación. Lo intento. Es que se ha ido la, se ha ido la pantalla. No, es, es digamos la misma instancia de Kotlin, pero son bases de datos distintas, con esquemas distintos… Sí, eso, es, otra, es, otro, es otro acercamiento, pero digamos que, que esto es, es, es iteración. Ahora mismo la infraestructura que tenemos es esta. Eh, si realmente identificamos que, que la query puede ir más rápido, que tenemos problemas con esa query, es que realmente no hay quien mire. Y eso no lo vemos ahora mismo. Entonces, a lo mejor no nos, no nos compensa meter otro, otra tecnología más, otro, o sea, manejar otro DEM para algo que realmente no estamos necesitando. Sí, 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 una muy buena pregunta. No, no, nosotros no lo hemos planteado todavía. ¿Vale? Muchas gracias por venir.